So guys, I made a community post 10 days ago asking if anyone had any disagreements with any of my takes. I did get a few, but I didn't take into account that about half the people don't know what a disagreement is. And beyond that, I also have people who came at me with disagreements on points I've never made. I also asked for a strong case, but mostly just got claims with no evidence whatsoever. At least provide a reason for your claims, even if you have zero evidence. Otherwise, I'll just dismiss them without evidence. I didn't realize how hard of an exercise this was going to be, so next time I'll try to make things more clear. I'm a little sick right now, so I might sound a little different from usual, but I hope you'll be able to bear with me. Okay, with that out of the way, let's take a look at how wrong people were. Impala says, stop lying about the Prince Oigen. Everybody knows she has the best Vanguard ship in the game. There is a big conspiracy against her because Big Yostar wants you to buy every new CA slash CB that they release so they can make the friggin' frogs gay. Please don't forget to take your medication. Next up, Azali says, Perseus is triple S tier, clearly you're nitpicking and biased my sources, I said so. The problem here is that your source is not very good, so you have been misled. Next, Max Max says, People in all of the AL discords fight all the time in their help channels. There have never been a universal agreement about anything in this community gameplay-wise. You should not waste your time with these people. I appreciate the heads up, but I do gotta farm content somehow. Also, this is not a disagreement. Moving on. The Hat says, I don't think Janus is very cute. This is just flat out wrong, so I'm not the least surprised at the complete lack of evidence and reasoning supporting this claim. Next, Dodo says, Harbin is still light cruiser, not destroyer despite her equipment. Okay, let's see what happens in game when I filter my dock for Dragon Empery destroyers. And as you can see, Harbin shows up, so that is debunked. Next, Nevertime says, Iron Blood Engineering is the best in the world. I don't really have an opinion on what engineering is the best in the world, so this is not really a disagreement. Next, ALGR says, I don't want disagreements, I want that secret sauce. Show me how to make those trash ships strong meme fleets so I can make people see the like you. Okay, at least you're self-aware that this is not a disagreement. Uh, just max your fleet tech, cats, and plus 13 everything to make up for the lack of strength from the ships. Next, Brangland says, I'll throw my hat in the ring. I can't remember where exactly you placed Perseus. But I do remember it being lower than Uni Retro, which in and of itself isn't something I disagree with. However, I think you place too much focus on that particular ranking on the recent World 14-15 content, because in the overwhelming majority of the rest of the game's content, the double preload on Perseus just isn't a downside. Like everything up to World 13 event stages, and you are in Opsi, the double preload on Perseus is either an upgrade or roughly equivalent to Uni in those scenarios. And to be clear, I'm not focusing on damage that much when I say this. I'm more focusing on the additional healing to keep the Vanguard alive, rather than the raw damage output, which at least I found to be particularly useful. I still use Uni over her nowadays, but having two heal procs guaranteed for each mob fleet fight, even the short ones, was pretty nice to have. Finally, a uh, proper post, so I will go point by point. Firstly, consider why Unicorn is better in chapters 14 and 15. You don't unlock new mechanics or secret strats. So really the difference is in the player's understanding of how to deal with the obstacles that the game throws at you, which can be taught in the earlier stages of the game as well. A very obvious example is suicide ships. Let's say a new player is using Unicorn and no battleship in the main fleet and their main fleet is struggling to survive due to suicide ships. You wouldn't teach them that Perseus is better because she heals the main fleet more, but instead tell them to add a battleship into the fleet to intercept the suicide ships. Following the same train of thought, in Chapter 10, when unavoidable enemy shelling starts becoming prevalent, you should be telling them that they just need to kill the enemies faster so that they don't get a chance to unleash on your main fleet. Which is the proper way of dealing with a threat, that carries over to whatever content is ahead, rather than saying Perseus heals more so just use her instead of Unicorn. 
Now let's consider the double preload, as that was the point that has been brought up. Unicorn strikes at about 20 seconds in, so until then, Perseus technically does heal more than Unicorn. But consider in actuality what a 20 second battle looks like. Consider a typical campaign node with 3 to 4 waves of enemies. If the battle ends in 20 seconds, that means each wave is alive for an average of only 5 seconds. I really struggle to visualize how the fleet could be taking a lot of damage if the enemies are dying that fast. Most likely, battles should last somewhere between 30 to 50 seconds for a player who is progressing through campaign, meaning that Unicorn would provide more healing in most if not all cases. In terms of Operation Siren, the mob fleet is probably where Perseus can be most easily justified, but once again, if you're finishing nodes in under 20 seconds, I highly doubt that you need the extra healing. Whereas Unicorn's Vanguard reload buff might actually save you a second or two here and there. And on top of everything I just said, I haven't even mentioned that Unicorn is available from the start in the guild shop, and a farmable campaign drop as well, so you don't even need to use any bullets to uncap her. Perseus by comparison is pretty much unobtainable by a new player using their resources wisely. Okay, next up, Old Drunk Lightning says, Unicorn and Aquila are crutches and people should stop using them. Uh, I don't have a stance on this, so it's not really a disagreement, but it's also kind of a pointless statement because where does it end? Next, Ricardo Marino says, Bitter Obsolete. G7 better now for high oxygen, high reload submarines. Okay, maybe people forgot why bitters were better in the first place, so this seems like it could actually be true. This time I will steel man your argument and then see if it's true, but next time if there's no reasoning nor evidence provided, I will just skip it. When he says high reload, high oxygen, I hope he really means middling, because the highest reload and oxy submarines can actually drop their snorkel for an oxy torp when using bitters. So there's really no way G70E would be better on them. Both the torps deal roughly the same amount of damage per hit. They are both homing, and the oxygen and reload requirements to get off exactly 24 torpedoes are about the same for both of them. Obviously for each load, bitters fire 3 torpedoes, whereas G70Es fire 2, so you're looking at 2 reload cycles for the G7E and 1 reload cycle for the bitters. So the things that can make G7E better is the fact that it has better tracking and better ammo mods against light and heavy armor, meaning that if an equal number of torpedoes land for both torps, G70E should in theory do more damage. As for bitters, they have lower oxygen and reload requirements, and the 20-ish second reload means that it syncs up well with surface fleet cooldowns such as Bismarck's Black Hole, Implacable's Root, and Helena's Radar Scan. In practice, submarines are divided into roughly three tiers based on their oxygen and reload. The first tier are the base subs like U47, U556 meta, and it extends to the other wolf packs except U37. All these submarines can get off two full loads of bitters with snorkel, more or less reliably with their oxygen and reload, but they struggle to fire off the very last salvo of G7E, even with 40 reload from cats. The next tier are submarines like Albacore and Kavala, who while they can get off 3 full loads of G7E with a snorkel, they cannot drop snorkel in favor of Oxytorp when using bitters because they don't have enough time to get off 2 full loads of bitters without snorkel. These are the subs that should do the best with G7E in comparison to bitters, as they get off the same number of torps and use the same auxiliaries regardless of torpedo choice. The last tier are submarines like Da Vinci, Archerfish, and U37, who have enough oxygen to drop their snorkel in favor of an oxytorp, and still have enough time to get off two full loads of bitters. They can't drop the snorkel when using G7E, so it should be obvious that the oxytorp would make the bitters do much more damage in this case. Even though the person who brought up the case had no evidence to support it, I went and did some testing myself anyway. Since he only mentioned high reload subs, whatever that means, I didn't bother testing the base level oxygen subs, like U47 and U556 meta. I will link the raw footage of the tests in the description if you want to check them out for yourself. First, looking at Albacore, 
you can see that there is quite a big difference between bidders and G7e. This is surprising because you would expect G7e to do better with the same auxiliaries. But just because the submarine should be able to get off some number of torps based on their reload and oxygen on paper, doesn't mean that they necessarily will. It's quite common for submarines or the enemy to move out of range randomly, leading to wasted time when they should be firing instead. This isn't accounted for on paper, but watch your submarines against this EX boss or any Operation Siren boss and it should be obvious. Rather than trying to min-max their oxygen requirements, having a little bit of leeway will allow your submarines to be much more consistent in practice. Next, I also compared the two torps using Da Vinci, who is able to drop Snorkel in favor of Oxytorp when using bitters. This results in more upfront damage, but this time it is more likely that G7E will be able to get off more torpedoes than the bitters. Regardless, the bitters win pretty convincingly once again. Since this particular boss doesn't move a lot, one could argue that G7Es, which have superior homing capabilities, are at a disadvantage here. However, based on the argument brought up by the commenter, which is, quote, bitter obsolete, it sounds like it should be a no-brainer that G7Es are just better, which is clearly not true. Until I see some concrete evidence showing that G7Es are superior to bitters in any kind of practical way and not just on paper, I believe this claim to be false. Next, looks to the moon says, I disagree. Great. Next, Vowel Fosbin says, 127mm are still better than 120 purples. There. I said it and I stick with it. You're a loss. Next, Fischio says, It would be interesting if you did some content about PvP fleets. Maybe some non-meta compositions that someone would click on looking for an easy win and then be confused as to why they lost. Interesting for thee, but not for me. This is not a disagreement, by the way. Next, Venom Runs Deep says, I think your video about CB damage in which you compared Hindenburg to Unzen kind of fits a niche scenario in which no AA is needed. Unzen clears Hindenburg. Uh, I think you might have a misunderstanding in regards to how AA works. For a ship like Unzen, who has relatively low AA in the grand scheme of things, she's barely contributing anything in terms of AA where it actually matters, meaning chapters 13 and 15. If you think the difference between Unzen's AA and Hindenburg's AA actually makes a tangible difference, there are too many things I would have to explain to clear up the misunderstanding, so I will just pray for you instead. This is not to say that Hindenburg is flat out better than Unzen in every way, which is not even a claim that I have ever made. Unzen is for sure stronger when she can get a high hit rate on her torpedoes, especially against heavy armor, but AA is probably at the bottom of the list as far as factors that matter when comparing the two. Okay, somebody already said this, so skip. Next, Aaron Levy says, I prefer to have South Dakota as S tier as she provides defensive buffs and AA for my 12-4 grind slash leveling fleet while allowing the Vanguard to do more damage. That is great to hear, and we are all looking forward to the release of your tier list, in which South Dakota is S tier. Next, Drew says, I didn't see any meta ships in your tier lists. Maybe a list with any that you overlooked that would make S or A tier. Or even just an update video to all lists that include the newer ships like Unzen, Guam, Tempesta, just any that would make S or A. Subs too. And also, maybe a video on offside fleet building. Neither of these are disagreements, please read the post before commenting. But I have made Opsi fleet building videos for Arbiters, I just can't be bothered to make them for general Operation Siren clearing since there really isn't much of a difference from campaign mobbing. Next, Macarius says, I reckon Volga slash Unicorn is a better combo than Aquila slash Unicorn. The reason Aquila is heavily favored over Volga is because of Musashi. As long as you're using Musashi, chances are at least two of your main fleet ships will be at full HP, meaning that there is at least a 1 in 3 chance that Volga's random heals are wasted. On the other hand, Aquila will always make sure your Musashi stays topped up, and the protection that Musashi provides to your other main fleet ships while she is healthy 
is worth a lot more than Volga's healing. And on top of that, Aquala is even better in Chapter 15 because all of her planes intercept, whereas Volga has to use dive bombers. And finally, user says Perseus is gay. Okay, so that was all the disagreements I received. I was hoping to come across something a little more difficult to argue against, but I guess it's hard when I'm right about literally everything. Anyways, that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed and see you in the next one.